Thank you everyone for joining us today for the launch of the Illicit Hub Mapping Initiative. This is an event co-hosted between the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and the German Federal Foreign Office whose support has enabled the initiative. By way of introduction, I am Mohamed Khan, I'm an analyst at the Global Initiative and coordinator of our work in Senegal and in the Republic of Guinea. The Illicit Hub Mapping is a flagship program of the Global Initiative West Africa Observatory and part of a larger program titled Promoting Stabilization Through Crime Sensitive Intervention in West Africa, which is funded by the German Federal Foreign Office. The mapping and the program as a whole seeks to build the evidence base around the intersection between illicit economies and instability in the West Africa region. As geographies of conflict and illicit economies increasingly overlap, understanding this intersection is key to ensure intervention are crime sensitive and avoid misdiagnosing dynamics and consequently making responses counterproductive. While it's clear that crime fits to conflict in some cases, illicit economies can also be important livelihoods and disrupting them can lead to long-term consequences to the relative legitimacy of states and alternative governance providers, including jihadist group. In this webinar, we will showcase the outline illicit hub map and present some of the key findings outlined in the accompanying report. Before we continue, let me remind you a few of some housekeeping points. Live presentation in French and Portuguese is available. Please click on the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to listen in. Nous vous rappelons également que le service d'interprétation est disponible. Cliquez sur le bouton à bas de votre écran à droite et choisissez la langue avec laquelle vous souhaitez suivre le webinaire. We ask the audience please to remain on mute throughout the whole session as we will be taking questions through the Q&A chat function. We also inform you that this webinar is being recorded. We are extremely privileged to have with us today, Mrs. Heike Tiller, to share with us some opening remarks. Mrs. Tiller is a director for civilian crisis prevention and stabilization at the German Foreign Office. Before this, she served as head of the Leadership Skills Center and head of the Division for External and Strategic Communication, as well as in various departments of the Foreign Office and in the German embassies. She has also served as German ambassador in Niamey. So, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Mrs. Heike Tiller. Over to Heike Tiller. Thank you, Mohamedou. Um, dear partners and colleagues, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I can't tell you how happy I am that uh, I'm, I'm given the opportunity to launch today with uh, the Global Initiative, uh, this virtual event. Um, on behalf of the Foreign Office, I would like to thank you all for taking the time and joining us today. And I would like you to allow me to thank also the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. They are conducting an excellent work in the FFO-funded project promoting stabilization through crime interventions in West Africa. The, the work that the Global Initiative is conducting in this program, and of which an important and timely result will be presented today, points are at a critical challenge. Organized criminal activity, including trafficking of illicit commodities is a significant driver of instability in West Africa, and they can prove it. Criminal networks and trafficking routes for drugs, arms, and other illicit uh, goods run through the whole region of West Africa. Organized crime undermines our efforts for peace and stability by weakening state structures, primarily through corruption. It also undermines legal economic development, which is the central dynamic to reduce social and economic inequality, and which is a driver for conflict itself. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, 
combating organized crime, enhancing justice, and improving the rule of law needs to be our shared interest when working on crises and conflicts. It is crucial to promote stability, development, and the rule of law in West Africa by better incorporating current and accurate crime-sensitive analysis into policymaking and into project programming. The overall objective is to make our crisis engagement more successful, more effective. But reliable information, criminal networks, illicit markets, their size and financial volume, as well as actors involved and the extent of corruption and co-option of state actors has been poorly available. Through its observatories in the region, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime has pioneered political economy, economy analysis of illicit flows, embedding the movement and control over commodities into the crime governance and conflict dynamics of the region. The Global Initiative and their partners have mapped out the key hubs of illicit peace in 18 countries across West Africa and designed a new metric, the Illicit Economies and Instability Monitor. In abbreviation, it's IEIM to be remembered. It assesses the degree to which specific hubs of illicit economy instability in the region, analyzing illicit economies as vectors of instability. In the here presented online tool, the 280 illicit hubs identified on a map are visually represented. Mapping these and understanding their role in facilitating illicit markets across African and Sahelian countries in Cameroon and the Central African Republic has the potential to greatly enhance our understanding of regional criminal economies, of the interlinkages between different hubs and actors in illicit markets and cross-border responses required. This will enable us to build an evidence base for stabilization and peace building interventions and to enhance engagement between civil society and state actors in responding to criminal markets. Let me again thank our colleagues from the Global Initiative and all who have contributed for this excellent piece of work. I can assure you that we will integrate your monitor into our uh, digital tools used in the ministry. And now it is my pleasure to hand over to my colleagues from the Global Initiative Against Organized Crime, who will showcase the online map and present the findings outlined in the accompanying report. Thank you very much. And back to you, Mohamedou. Thank you very much. To Heike Chilo for being here with us today. We are very grateful to the German Federal Foreign Office for their general support. On the speaker's panel today, we have Lucia Bird, Director of the Observatory of Illicit Economies in West Africa. We also have Kingsley Maduweke, Nigeria Research Coordinator at the Global Initiative, and Lies Taxiria, Senior Analyst at the Global Initiative. In this event, will be sharing the findings of the Illicit Help Mapping Initiative. Illicit economies and instability are very complex and intertwining phenomena, but the dynamics of the crime conflict nexus are very often misunderstood. The Illicit Help Mapping Initiative was therefore designed to help build the evidence base in the context of this relationship. We are all very excited by this project. And so without any further delay, we present to you first a brief video, of the illicit help mapping in West Africa. The security situation across areas of West Africa, the Sahel, Cameroon, and the Central African Republic is deteriorating. Conflict in the region is in flux 
armed groups are multiplying. The intensity and geographic dispersion of violence is increasing, spilling across borders, and civilians are regularly the target of attacks. Across much of West Africa, illicit economies are playing a huge role in enabling and prolonging the conflict and instability. There has been no systematic attempt to map out illicit economies in West Africa, the Sahel, Cameroon and the Central African Republic and assess how they interact with conflict and instability until now. We have been taking a look at the key hubs of illicit economies across the region, identifying hotspots, transit points and broader crime zones. And with the help of hundreds of civil society members, as well as local communities in West Africa, national government stakeholders and international organisations, we've identified 280 illicit hubs. And we were particularly interested to understand how illicit economies in these hubs interact with conflict and instability. Now, it's key to note that not all illicit economies fuel conflict and instability, but it's important to understand which do. Our new tool, the Illicit Economies and Instability Monitor, classifies each hub according to the degree to which illicit economies in that hub act as vectors of instability. From arms trafficking and the illicit gold trade to the counterfeit medicines trafficking and the cocaine trade, there are many illicit economies embedded in rural areas, villages, towns and cities across West Africa. In Jos, a central Nigerian city around 180 kilometers north of Abuja, the capital, violence linked to illicit economies has surged since 2021. Arms trafficking, cattle rustling and kidnap for ransom are just three of the illicit economies that are flourishing. Community leaders and experts agree that levels of violence and crime in Jos have seen a sharp resurgence since 2021. More than 7,000 people have been killed and at least 500,000 others have been displaced from their homes. Livelihoods have been destroyed, pushing many people to rely on illicit activities. The proliferation of criminal groups and armed political groups and the ensuing instability they generate have driven demand for arms. This demand has fueled supply in conflict areas like Jos, while the growing demand for self-protection has normalized access to weapons and legitimized the weapons trade. Essentially, the illicit arms trade has a knock-on effect, allowing for other illicit economies to boom. These include, for example, kidnapping for ransom, the illicit gold trade, and cattle rustling, among others. À la suite de, de, du contexte de l'insécurité, de la violence et des conflits, le vol de bétail est devenu maintenant un phénomène criminel, une activité criminelle. Les divers acteurs armés se livrent à cette pratique pour se financer, pour s'approvisionner, pour rétribuer les combattants et aussi pour s'alimenter. Souvent, c'est tout un troupeau qui est enlevé. Et si avant on parlait de 2, 3, aujourd'hui on parle de centaines. L'impact, le premier impact visible, c'est l'insécurité alimentaire. Parce que l'économie, la principale économie dans ces zones et pour ces communautés, c'est les chefs Et ces communautés vont dans les marchés et pour échanger pour vendre ces bouteilles, pour pouvoir se rendre en aliment. Le, le deuxième impact, le deuxième impact, est aussi social, donc ça conduit à l'effritement des liens sociaux entre ces différentes communautés qui sont armées, les propriétaires et se sont procurés des armes pour se défendre, pour protéger les, les bétails. Et cela a induit à plusieurs affrontements entre les groupes armés, entre eux, entre les groupes armés, les bandits et entre tout ceci et les propriétaires de, de, de bétails.
If we look at the map, we can see how geography plays an important role in illicit economy and instability dynamics. Illicit hubs inland are far more likely to be closely linked to conflict and instability than illicit hubs on the coast of West Africa. In coastal West Africa, more than 9 out of 10 illicit hubs score either low or medium on the monitor. In Central Africa and the Sahel, on the other hand, more than half of illicit hubs score either high or very high on the monitor. This is largely because of the geography of conflict. Swathes of Central Africa and the Sahel are heavily affected by conflict and violence, which feeds and is fed by illicit economies. Burkina Faso has been shaken since 2016 by a wave of insecurity. It's true that much of this violence has been both inspired but also nurtured by violent extremist groups. But we should not also forget that this is a homegrown insurgent. We know, for example, that the Burkina Bay and Saudi Islam has been engaging in violence since 2016 and has won a lot of support from the local population. And as armed groups grow more reliant, on exploiting communal violence, the civilian demand for weapons is likely to increase. Armed groups have a variety of relationships with illicit and criminal networks in Burkina Faso. However, they have been known for gaining local support by allowing people to gain access to illicit activities. Although illicit hubs inland are more likely to be linked to conflict, we shouldn't ignore the illicit activities taking place in coastal regions. In fact, there are many major hubs of illicit economies in coastal West Africa. Transport infrastructure, such as airports and seaports, are key nodes in regional and global illicit economies. Les aéroports et le port sont des portes d'entrée. Au niveau du port, on a des marchandises qui rentrent et il peut se trouver que des marchandises soient des marchandises de contrebande ou des marchandises euh, illégales. Et dans ce cas, le problème qui se pose, c'est à chercher à mettre un nom sur le propriété de ces marchandises. Mais ce n'est pas toujours le cas, puisque les, les marchandises sont transportées par des, disons, des intermédiaires, par des sous-traitants, euh, des transporteurs. Des transporteurs, ils transportent la marchandise. Mais si vous saisissez la marchandise, ben, lui, il n'est que le transporteur. Ces activités illicites. En fait, les activités illicites peuvent profiter au, au réseau criminel et au, aux groupes armés ou aux groupes euh, djihadistes. D'ailleurs, le risque existe. Le risque entre les activités illicites et, euh, disons, le ravitaillement euh, des, des réseaux criminels ou des bandes armées. One key challenge to tackling the negative impacts of illicit economies in West Africa is that many communities rely on these economies as livelihoods. Responses that fail to recognize this are likely to engender significant pushback. And this reliance is only set to increase. A number of factors like climate change and global escalating inflation, which are driving up the price of core foodstuffs and enhancing mean that more communities will be forced to rely on informal and in some cases illicit livelihoods where no formal alternatives exist. Formas de economia ilícita que estão operando em Guiné-Bissau e tráfico de droga, pesca ilegal e tráfico de madeira. É fator que está bem baixo com a provina branca e o capital e branqueamento de capital mangariata financiar atividade política e está contribuindo à instabilidade política própria e social de Guiné-Bissau. Tráfico de madeira na Guiné-Bissau está facilitado para a própria agente de Estado. Eles que têm emitido licença de forma ilegal e sem controle para o próprio cidadão nacional. E o cidadão nacional faz e está a contratar cidadão estrangeiro que está a fazer que corte de maneira ilegal, depois e também acabar de, traf de vir traficar para vias de fronteira. As the security situation deteriorates across many areas in the region, the geography of conflict and of illicit economies is increasingly overlapping. Understanding how these dynamics interact is crucial to stabilization programming. 
The West African region is affected by illicit economies and conflict in different ways, which means each illicit hub is also unique. But neither is each illicit hub isolated. They are all interconnected. This is why understanding the role of illicit economies across the whole region, as well as in areas experiencing flares of instability and violence, is essential in order to craft appropriate responses. Thank you very much. I hope this video will give you a taste of what this research is all about and why it's so important to look at the relationship between illicit economies and instability in West Africa. My colleague will now dig deeper into the research. They will discuss the findings and the implication of this research before moving into the question and answer session. Can I remind all of you that you are encouraged to post any question into the Q&A Zoom function as the presenters are speaking, and we'll get back to them at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over to my colleague. Lucia, over to you. Thank you very much, Mohamed. And thank you everyone for joining us. We are really excited to share some of the findings of the mapping initiative, which was coordinated as part of the wider program titled Promoting Stabilization Through Crime Sensitive Interventions in West Africa, which has been enabled by support from the German Federal Foreign Office. Slideshow, please. This mapping initiative and the program as a whole seeks to build the evidence base around the intersection between illicit economies and instability in the West Africa region, and therefore support um, responses to both illicit economies and insecurity. Next slide, please. This was the main driver for the mapping initiative in the first place. So first, as we'll explain in further detail, the GITOC coordinated a mapping of illicit economies across West Africa, identifying the key hubs of illicit markets. And this sought to build a granular picture of sub-national illicit economy dynamics, bringing together existing pools of knowledge and create a public consolidated repository of evidence around illicit markets in the region. Secondly, and in order to identify which illicit hubs were more important in terms of their knock-on effect on conflict and stability across West Africa, the GITOC developed the Illicit Economies and Instability Monitor. The monitor helps to identify areas where illicit markets play the most important roles as vectors of instability and conflict in the subregion, empowering policymakers to prioritize specific areas and specific dynamics for targeted action to respond to illicit economies as part of wider stabilization toolkits. There are already a number of indices and metrics of instability, and in the shape of the Organized Crime Index, a global index looking at the scope and scale of criminal markets and resilience at a national level. But what this monitor does is focus on assessing the relationship between illicit economies and instability at a sub-national level. In other words, the gap that the monitor addresses is to consider how instability connects to crime. And this plugs into the wider debate around how to consider crime in stabilization programming. Next slide, please. Kingsley, over to you. I think Kingsley may be having a connectivity issue, so I will um, take over to explain a little bit more about the methodology. So this research initiative mapping uh, 15 ECOWAS member countries, as well as Cameroon, the Central African Republic and Chad. Kingsley, are you back with us? Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I had an internet glitch. Can you hear me now? Perfectly, please do take okay. over. Yeah, um, so first of all, um, we'll look at uh, the methods uh, used so we'll outline the steps we adopted in the mapping process. Um, next slide, please. 
This is a research initiative which seeks to map the regional markets in West Africa. It focuses on 15 ECOWAS member states, including Cameroon, Central African Republic, and Chad. The aim of the exercise is to identify the key illicit hubs, hotspots, transit points, and broader zones of criminality across the region. Hotspots are key hubs of illicit activity, whereas transit points are places like border crossings, transport and trade infrastructure nodes, and so on, that are leveraged for the trafficking of illicit commodities. And then crime zones are broader areas of criminality that may encompass a number of different hotspots or transit points. Next slide, please. The mapping process um, was a multi-stage process. First, the GTOC team developed a structured guidance for identifying illicit hubs, drawing from literature and research expertise. Following this, a preliminary mapping for each country was then drafted based on our institutional expertise. An extensive literature review was also conducted with, and then of course, key stakeholders interviews, both virtually and in person and extensive field work across the region. And then finally, country specific roundtables, both virtual and in-person were then convened to verify and finalize the illicit hope map mapping findings for each country. Across all stages of the research, the GI research team engaged with over 650 different stakeholders, including over 100 individuals from, the inter from international organizations, 70 national government stakeholders, and over 380 civil society and community members. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna um, explain a little bit in more depth what the illicit economies and, and instability monitor is. Uh, next slide, please. So to recap what has, what has been said, so really the monitor assesses to what extent illicit markets in a specific hub operate as vectors of instability. And the, the monitor is, is made up of three, three separate components, as you can see on, on the slide here. The first component is violence and instability. And this component includes both indicators of violence and instability itself, but also factors that have been identified as drivers of instability and, and, and enablers of illicit economies. So the second component uh, is crime conflict links. And this component really captures the relationship between illicit economies on the one hand and conflict and instability on the other hand. And as you can see from the slide, this component is intentionally um, the component with the highest score because it's, it's really at the heart of what it is that we're seeking to analyze. And then finally, the third component is accelerators. So this in turn comprises two subcomponents. The first is infrastructure. And what the infrastructure subcomponent really looks at is essentially capturing a hub's propensity to play a significant role in transnational flows, and that's both licit and illicit flows, as a function of their uh, geography and of their trade infrastructure. And then stress factors are those conditions that could, could exacerbate or, or sort of be the so-called root causes of instability and, and illicit economies. Now, the monitor itself is a score of 30 overall, which you can see at the top of the, the diagram on the slide. 
And each hub gets a score out of 30, and each hub can be classified uh, into one of four different categories based on the overall score. So you can see them on the right-hand side of the slide. Low is for scores below 10. Moderate or medium is for scores between 10 and 15. High is for scores between 15 and 20. And then very high is for those illicit hubs that score above 20 on the monitor. So, and I think this is really important to, to sort of hone in on is that when we're talking about high or medium or, or low or very high, we're talking about the connection between illicit economies and instability. So if I say, you know, the, the, the hub scores very high, what I'm saying is that there is a high, a very high nexus between illicit economies in that hub and conflict and instability. Um, and actually, within the within the model, within the monitor itself, the, the crime conflict links component, which, as I said, is the one that that really comprises those indicators that are aimed at evaluating the, the direct impact of illicit economies on on conflict and instability. This subcomponent has, uh, or this component, should I say, has the, the strongest correlation uh, at 0.9 with the overall, um, the overall monitor score. So this really supports the use of the monitor as a metric for assessing whether illicit economies fuel instability in any given hub. And you know, the issue of, of causality, um, you know, illicit economies driving or causing instability and conflict is, is a very complex one, and, and it's explored in, in, in much further detail in, in the report itself. Next slide, please. So I'm going to delve into some, but not all, of the key findings that we, that, from our research that we, that we present um, in the report. Uh, next slide, please. So I think the first thing to note is that Although 280 illicit hubs were identified across the region, across the 18 countries, just under a quarter, so it was 23%, of the hubs identified, so of the 280 hubs, have either high or very high monitor scores. So as I explained in the previous slide, that means you know, that there is a high nexus between illicit economies in that hub and instability. But conversely, 45% of all illicit hubs, so it's 127 of the 280 illicit hubs, are, are low monitor hubs, so they score low. Now, the overwhelming majority of illicit hubs, nine in more than nine in 10, are located on or in cl close proximity to the coast. Um, these ones have low or, or medium monitor scores. And in fact, only two illicit hubs on the coast have very high uh, monitor scores. Now, what we can see from, from the findings of the monitor is that illicit hubs across Central Africa and the Sahel are, are, are far more likely to be high or very high monitor hubs due in large part, we think, to the fact that these are the geographies that are most affected by conflict and violence. And I mean, if, you know, of the 83 illicit hubs identified across, across that region, across Central Africa and the Sahel, 64% of them, so almost two thirds, are high or very high monitor hubs. And if you contrast this um, to, to the 6% uh, that are high or very high across coastal West Africa, you can see the differences in geography, the differences that geography plays. Um, next slide, please. Now, another really important finding from our research revolves around trade infrastructure. So what we found was that, that seaports and airports across West Africa were identified really as key transit points for illicit commodities. Which, which highlights the role that, that these play as, as sort of key nodes in regional and global illicit economies. Now, looking at the results of the monitor when it comes to seaports and, and, and airports and, and other sort of trade infrastructure, while, while most of airports and seaports are 
um, low monitor hubs, there are several ports actually across the region that act as important transit points for commodities which flow to conflict areas and, and so conflict actors within the region. So for example, uh, Conakry Airport in the Republic of Guinea plays an important role as an export point for gold, including gold that, that's mined in Mali, for example, where you know, we know that, that gold is, is, is intricately linked to dynamics of instability. Uh, another example, Kotonou Port, for example, in, in Bena, a major trade hub. This is also an important point um, of import for a range of different illicit commodities, not least cocaine, but also vehicles and, and motorbikes, you know, many of which are then trafficked northwards to landlocked countries. Um, and in fact, if you look at the statistics of the port, 80% of imports into Cotonou port are, are redistributed to neighboring countries. And then just one final point, I think, on, on, on trade infrastructure is that road infrastructure is actually similarly important in facilitating the flows of illicit commodities. So of all of the 280 illicit hubs, only 10% were or, or are not located on or, or near um, major operational roads, which sort of underscores the importance of Connectivity to to the you know to the majority of illicit economies, um, and I think what's 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 really important and, and you know important to note is that not only do roads serve as connectors between illicit hubs, but actually roads and highways and expressways are also often sites of illicit activities themselves. So, for example, banditry or kidnap for ransom illicit taxation, extortion, for example, all of these occur on roads, uh, highlighting their sort of, you know, the, the double, double importance of, of road infrastructure to, to, to criminal dynamics, but also to instability dynamics. Next slide, please. Turning to look at um, illicit economies and the major markets that featured across the different hubs, as you can see on the slide, the prominence of certain illicit economies varies considerably across the monitor spectrum. And we will focus on four illicit economies where the discrepancies are highest. Firstly, the cocaine trade is the illicit economy with the greatest discrepancy and prevalence rate between lower and higher monitor scoring hubs. The cocaine trade was identified as a major market in just under a quarter of all illicit hubs across the region. However, it features in only 8% of those illicit hubs with monitor scores above 15, i.e. those hubs that were assessed to be important vectors of conflict and instability across the region. In contrast, it features in 33% of the lowest scoring hubs, a very significant contrast. To some extent, this is a product of geography and underscores the importance of coastal hubs as import points in the cocaine trade. But it's also because cocaine is among the most high value commodities flowing through the region. And so trafficking networks often avoid the most high risk environments, for example, in the Sahel region, and we have seen over time displacement of cocaine trafficking routes from areas of high instability, although, of course, the situation is dynamic. Next slide, please. In contrast, arms trafficking is twice as likely to feature as a major market in high and very high hubs as opposed to low or medium hubs. Arms trafficking features as a major market in more than half of all illicit hubs in the high and very high monitor classifications, but only one in four of the low and medium monitor hubs. These findings underscore our understanding of the arms market as an accelerant market, which plays an important role in fueling instability, weaponizing existing conflict, and escalating the use of violence as a mechanism for control of illicit economies. Kidnap for Ransom is also among the illicit economies to feature far more prominently in illicit hubs that are more significant vectors of conflict and instability than those that are not. The illicit economy is a major market in only 13% of hubs with low monitor scores, 
Conversely, it features in 22% of high and very high scoring hubs. Cattle rustling is similarly disproportionately prevalent in illicit hubs where illicit economies are drivers of instability, featuring in 15% of high and very high hubs, but only 4% of low hubs. Next slide, please. Before we explore how these accelerant markets play out in a really important country in the region, Nigeria, we wanted to illustrate the contrasting relationships of distinct markets with stability using a different data set, the Organized Crime Index, which measures levels of organized criminality at a national level. The results of the index looking at Africa as a whole show that most criminal markets have some negative correlation with peace and stability. On the slide we have on the X axis, the country scores for arms trafficking on the left and the cocaine trade on the right against the global peace index on the Y axis of both graphs. The higher up the Y axis you go, the less peaceful a country is. As you can see, there's a clear difference with arms trafficking showing a far higher degree of correlation with peace indicators than the cocaine trade, which has no statistically significant relationship. So we can see that findings at national and subnational level are aligning and supporting each other. Next slide, please. Turning to illicit economies in Nigeria, the arms trafficking market commonly appears in tandem with three other illicit economies that are often linked to a high degree of weaponization. These illicit economies include, these illicit economies include kidnap for ransom, cattle rustling, and the illicit gold trade. For example, there are 10 illicit hubs that feature arms trafficking, cattle rustling, and kidnap for ransom as major mm. markets. All 10 are located in Nigeria, underlining the particularly strong nexus between these illicit economies in the country and their relative prevalence. Illustratively, almost 50% of the hubs in which kidnap for ransom is a significant market also features the arms trafficking market. These markets tend to cluster in illicit hubs that score higher on the monitor. Forests such as Sububu, Demsado, and Kamaku, as well as the Lake Chad area are just a few examples. In particular, large forests and national parks play an important role in the dynamics of illicit hubs across the region. Let's zoom in on Ansado Forest in Northwest Nigeria as an example. This illicit hub has a concentration of multiple illicit markets, including cattle rustling, kidnapping for ransom, arms trafficking, and other illicit trades. As incidents of cattle rustling and kidnapping increase, individuals and communities stockpile arms to defend themselves, resulting in a surge in demand and a huge arms trafficking market. Next slide, please. Having touched on some of the key findings of the research, we wanted to touch upon some of the policy implications. Next slide, please. We drew a number of programming and policy implications from our analysis, and we workshop these in roundtables and dialogues with stakeholders across West Africa. These are explored in the accompanying report, and we outlined just three of them here. Firstly, Stabilization interventions should have clearly delineated goals, be crime sensitive and prioritize reducing violence over broad brush attempts to respond to illicit economies. Misdiagnosing the relationship between illicit economies and conflict can undermine the impact of interventions and render counter crime initiatives counterproductive, 
in some cases triggering increased violence. So the key goal of reducing violence and supporting stability should be prioritized. Often this is assumed to be aligned with goals of addressing illicit economies, but this is not always the case. Assumptions about the alignment of these two goals are based on perceptions that armed groups draw revenues and supplies from illicit economies, and therefore that cutting off um, illicit economies um, cuts off armed actors from economic opportunities. But while such alignment is correct in some cases, in others it's not. And the benefit of cutting off some illicit supply chains to the extent that this is feasible may be offset by the impacts of such steps on local communities. Secondly, it's key to tailor responses to the market typology and its role in shaping instability and violence, as well as the contextual dynamics. As we've started to explore a bit, there really is a significant range in how different illicit economies interact with stability. And we can start to apply a set of indicators to analyze the impact of illicit markets and ensure we are crafting appropriate responses. These indicators include consideration of revenue sharing arrangements. So uh, the profits from the illicit market shared among a narrow group or do they disperse more widely across the community? The wider the dispersal of the profits, the more likely this is to translate into greater legitimacy and therefore crackdowns against this economy or market are likely to trigger a backlash um, and can in fact be destabilizing. A second indicator which links very much to the first is the importance of considering community um, perceptions of legitimacy because where a market is broadly perceived to be legitimate, responses that seek to disrupt it may well engender significant resistance and could drive recruitment into armed groups. Creating space for conflict actors to regulate um, illicit markets that are perceived to be legitimate is damaging, not only because it provides conflict actors with revenue flows, but because it enhances their legitimacy at the expense of the legitimacy of the state. The third indicator is whether the illicit economy um, is based on transit or production. Um, so is there a local market for the commodity or does it simply transit through the region? Transit commodities will often benefit a narrower group of stakeholders um, and particularly where they are very high value will engender very structured protection economies. And a fourth indicator is to really consider the relationship between the illicit economy and intercommunal tensions. Does the illicit market typically pit different ethnicities or religious groups against each other, fueling existing rifts? If so, these characteristics are of significant concern and they could point to the role of the market in fueling short and long term conflicts. And these should be prioritized for a response. Our, our third policy implication we'd like to highlight is that tackling corruption and protection structures at seaports should be prioritized. State embedded actors are disproportionately prominent in illicit economies present in seaports, suggesting that tackling corruption there should be a priority. And this is particularly true because of the important role that maritime trafficking routes play in the transit of certain illicit economies, including counterfeit medicines, um, through the region, which can cause particularly severe harm to communities. Next slide, please. We have explored some of the key findings of our research. Um, there is more detail in the accompanying report. And of course, we encourage you also to explore the online tool. Thank you very much um, for joining us today. And that's the end of our um, presentation. Mohammed, back over to you. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, thanks, Kingsley and Lias, for this fascinating and very insightful presentation. I think it's now very clear that the relationship between illicit economies and instability is not necessarily straightforward. And while some illicit economies are heavily straight, uh, linked to conflict, not all of them actually are. So as you mentioned in your presentation, if you're trying to design interventions with the aim of stabilizing countries in, in, in the wider region, it's really important these are sensitive to the crime conflict dynamic. We are now going to take some questions from the audience. Once again, do continue to submit questions in the Q&A function, and we'll do all our best to get through them as 
much as possible. Our first question is uh, uh, from Pedro. Pedro is asking, say, I understand that given its geographical position, West African countries tend to be used by Latin American criminal organization to move their product to Europe due to the topology of the borders and of these countries and due to the weak rule of law. Are there any specific Latin American criminal organization like Sinola, Cartel, or Primero Commando with influence in that region? What are the local African criminal or terrorist organizations that converge with the Latin American criminal groups? And what countries see that we see the most activities that they are actually carrying on? We have another question from. from uh, Wian Grant, who is asking which of these of international organizations are listening to your conclusion and which not. The third question is, is from uh, Cohen. Cohen, who is asking, how do you make sure that your mapping of zones stay up to date in a dynamic environment? So I think we're going to stop with the three first questions, then we will get back to the rest. Uh, Sh Lucia, should we go to you first? Sure, and thank you very much for these really interesting questions. So on, I'll start with a question around the connections with Latin America um, and the transit um, through the West Africa region. Um, that's right, of course, um, that uh, a number of commodities transit through um, West Africa predominantly um, on their way to consumer markets in Europe from Latin America. A key market there is, of course, the cocaine trafficking market. Um, the, the bulk of this movement um, happens by sea, so it's maritime trafficking and then it enters the West African um, region either through seaports, um, in some cases uh, already containerized, or at other porous points on, on the coast. Um, in terms of the, the connections um, between groups in Latin America and groups in West Africa, we do know, of course, that these connections exist. Historically, there was a, a presence of representatives of a number of um, Latin America criminal organizations um, in different countries in West Africa. Um, there has also been tracked in some cases, um, West African nationals and members of networks being present in uh, the Latin America region. In terms of um, where the majority of the maritime um, cocaine imports that reach West Africa come from, the vast majority um, that have been tracked come from Brazil. Um, and so we are exploring um, what the possible connection with the PCC could be. Um, further, there have been some investigations um, not done by ourselves, but done by all the other organizations that have pointed to the presence of representatives of the Mexican Sinaloa cartel in various countries um, in West Africa, including in Mali. Um, and in terms of which countries see the most activity, well, of course, um, the coastal countries um, play important roles as import points. Um, there are three key um, hubs for, for the importation area. We have the Western hub, that includes Guinea-Bissau, Senegal, Guinea, and Gambia. Then we have the more central hub um, that includes Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana. And then we have the hub that, um, that focuses around Nigeria and Benin. So really we see imports across a range of the coastline um, and this uh, coordination and engagement between Latin American networks and networks operating in West Africa is clearly crucial to this. Um, Perhaps I'll, I'll hand over to Leas on the point around um, keeping our research dynamic. Thank you very much. And again, yes, thank you to, to all of the, the, the really interesting um, and important questions posed. I think just to add on, on the updating, the, this research, I mean, Kingsley mentioned it in, in the presentation, we engage with over 650 uh, individuals, whether they be from uh, international organizations or government stakeholders um, or, of course, civil society and community members. Um, and to having identified 280 illicit hubs across 18, country, 18 countries, as I'm sure you can imagine, it is, is uh, quite an intensive research. 
in particular at the granularity with which we did it, right? So looking at the website, again, I encourage you all to, to go look at the online tool. For each illicit hub, you can see the um, a few paragraphs of a justification text on the sort of narrative of what the dynamics are. Um, so, you know, the, the, the main idea of, of this initial mapping was to create a sort of baseline foundation of the evidence base um, for illicit economies and then, of course, obviously their links with, with conflict and instability. But we do recognize, of course, that, you know, criminal dynamics are dynamic, right? So they change and they will, um, they will you know, they will change over time. I think, you know, the, the threats posed by illicit economies and, and sort of the, the nuance of the, of the dynamics between illicit economies and, and instability are very much being increasingly recognized by, by government stakeholders and policymakers. And, and you know, several successful interventions have, have, have been made. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why it's so important to monitor the dynamics over time is to be able to understand the impact of, of the responses. Um, but also, I think on the, on the sort of, on the, on the flip side of that, quite often when there is law enforcement action or enforcement intervention, um, there's sort of what, what we refer to as, as the sort of the balloon effect, right? Or the displacement effect. So enforcement in one area can, can sort of displace the illicit economies to, to another. Um, and so being able to monitor future trends would 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 basically allow policymakers to identify where where this displacement is happening, um, not only of the illicit economies themselves, but of course of the the, the sort of the instability that's linked to it. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Back to you. Mahmoud. Thank you, colleagues, for your answers. There, uh, we're going to take three more questions from the audience. Um, and the first question we have here is from Joseph Benita, who's asking on which frequency will this monitoring evaluation uh, tool will be updated and will you publicly release the data? Uh, we have another question from uh, Olgria Olmedo saying, if there are any indication of where foreign crimes are more likely to happen, and what other illicit economies are also likely to take place in countries with high prevalence of foreign crime? Uh, we have another question uh, from uh, Spectator Anonym. How can this tool be replicated for other regions? Example, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America. Uh, Lucia, you have the floor. Of course, and sorry, I realised that we missed out um, you and Grant's question on international organisations in our no. last round. So I'll I'll pick it up here. Um, so of course we we've only just released the findings of of the mapping initiative, and we look forward to engaging much more with um, stakeholders around these findings. But a number of international organisations were absolutely pivotal um, to the research that went into the mapping process. And we have a very close relationship with a number of international organizations across the region. For example, we actually have a joint observatory with UNDP in Guinea-Bissau, um, which uh, works very closely with civil society in the country. But we'd also like to highlight that a reason of ma um, for making the, the map public and a significant proportion of the data that we collected public is to enable other organizations, including international organizations, um, governments, other civil society stakeholders, to use the data in their own research and analysis and draw their own conclusions. And we also look forward to um, engaging uh, around that point. Thank you, Lias, perhaps over to you. Yeah, thank you. So I think on, on, on fauna crimes, what some of our findings, um, sort of among the, the key findings of our research was, was actually that there were certain illicit economies, which, which we sort of discussed in the presentation, that are particularly linked to conflict and instability, right? So whether that is kidnapped for ransom um, or, or arms trafficking, of course, as, a, as sort of accelerant markets, um, and, and, but also cattle rustling. Um, now, cattle rustling was, was particularly 
prominent and particularly prevalent in those illicit hubs, as Kingsley mentioned, that uh, score higher on the uh, on the on the monitor. But there are also other illicit hubs across West Africa that um, sort of feature other types of fauna crime. So, you know, poaching of, of rare animal species and so on. Now, quite often, the, I think the link between um, wildlife crime in terms of, of fauna, um, fauna crimes and, and conflict actors wasn't one of the strongest um, findings that, we, that, that emerged from our research. But there are, broadly speaking, across the region, I should add, but there are certain illicit hubs across the region where poaching of, of wild animals is essentially used as, as funding for, for actors in so for, for conflict actors. So um, in Cameroon, for example, um, you know, in, in, in certain national parks in, in north north and northeast Cameroon, the you know, national parks are are sort of sites of poaching of, of, of elephant ivory and, and other rare animal species species by conflict actors, whether these be, um, you know, separatist groups or, or, or other conflict actors, mostly also from, from sort of region in com uh, neighboring countries to Cameroon. Um, so again, it's, 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 it's quite a nuanced um, discussion again, in terms of, you know, fauna crime isn't always linked to conflict and instability, but it is an important source of funding for certain conflict actors across the region. Thank oh, you. Sorry, sorry Mohamedou, I just to, to, to sort of retouch on, on the issue of Go ahead, yes. Thing. Um, you know, I, I spoke to, I'm, I won't repeat again, but I, I sort of spoke to, you know, the need for, for updating, um, for, for, for updating the, the sort of the findings as, as, as we go along. I mean, due to the sort of the inherently, resource intensive um, sort of structure of this research, as I said, you know, 280 illicit hubs reaching out to, to over 650 um, individuals. The, you know, it will be um, a challenge to, to keep the uh, illicit hub mapping and the monitor data updated on a, on a very regular periodic basis. Um, but I think it is important to particularly focus on the dynamics where um, where illicit economies and, and conflict and instability were identified as being intimately linked um, for the purposes of monitoring, it should be those hubs that are, that are focused upon and, and we will in, in future work towards that. Thank you. Thank you, Lies. Um, before we take another set of three questions, let me quickly remind to the audience that you feel free to ask your question in English, French, or Portuguese, and we'd be very happy to answer it. Uh, now we have a question from Nigeria or from a Nigerian, uh, Ngozi Ozuma uh, from University of Nigeria, who said, before the insurgency in northeast, near northeastern borderland of Nigeria, migrant smugglers used to the, the area as a route to connect to Chad first before making a detour to Agadez in Niger in order to ev evade arrest. Why did the insurgent group Iswap, Boko Haram, not exploit their authority to key into human trafficking and migrant smuggling, like their counterpart in the Liptako Gurma region, who helped in the smuggling and trafficking of migrants to North Africa? Uh, another question from Abim, who said, does global initiative in carrying out research for this project look into criminal or financial investigation as a way of connecting the crime across continent? If yes, do you have this report included in the mapping? And a last question from Desiree, who first thank all the presenters and said, I just want to ask if through your research, you got some interesting data of this crime on, in Cote d'Ivoire and what do you think the impact of a rapid development in this Uh, in this uh, parallel economy in that country is on the degra degradation observed in the neighboring countries, for example, in Burkina Faso. He took the example of, of Burkina Faso. Uh, Kingsley, should we start with you? Um, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. 
um, I will jump in here, but um, before I respond to Ngozi's question on um, human trafficking uh, in relation to Boko Haram and ISWAP, I want to touch on a question that I think uh, we skipped, which uh, is a very important question that Eric asked, which is um, uh, what, what is the role? What, what, to what degree uh, do communities participate in illicit economies? And uh, what is the GI doing? What does the GI know about that? And what research are we doing on that? And to start with, I want to say uh, the report, which is a crime paradox uh, published on Nigeria. One of the key findings was um, the key role that some communities play in driving illicit economies. Uh, so we have certain types of illicit economies that have stabilizing influences on communities. For example, the rice smuggling illicit market in the Southwest. Um, you also have uh, the oil bunkering and illegal oil smuggling market in the Niger Delta region. Uh, this are uh, illicit economies with large participation from local communities, and they usually have a stabilizing influence on communities. And the key recommendation is uh, authorities need to be very constructive in responding to such illicit economies because of the local legitimacy that they enjoy. Um, any military responses can usually spark major pushback and in the process, fuel instability in these localities. So there's need for very context sensitive responses that it take into account the local legitimacy that this type of illicit economies enjoy. Um, I'll now jump into the question um, from Ungozi that um, touches, and it's a very interesting question. Why didn't ISWAP or Boko Haram took advantage of the human trafficking routes, especially uh, between Niger, between Nigeria, the Niger border, and even Chad. And the question was, uh, the, question, the, the answer is um, that, of course, there, there, there are a few, there are some, there's some evidence that actually these groups engage in human trafficking, but not on a very large scale. But the main thing is, they were involved in other illicit economies. For example, cattle rustling was very extremely lucrative between 2013, I think even up to 2016, Boko Haram was deeply involved in cattle rustling. Uh, but of course, due to the depletion of uh, cattle and then um, of course, People, uh, herders were relocating, especially from the Lake Chad region. What happened was kidnapping became the next opportunistic illicit market. And Boko Haram became a major uh, actor in uh, kidnapping for ransom. And um, we have seen kidnapping for ransom now becoming a major security challenge in the Northwest and parts of the North central regions of Nigeria. Uh, but that is, of course, not to say these groups have never been engaged in human trafficking. It's just to say they have opportunistically taken advantage of other illicit markets that tend to be more lucrative, you know, for different reasons. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kingsley. Um... Uh, we have a very uh, interesting comment from Wazu Omaru, who we say hello uh, for being with us, thank you, who said, kindly highlight the relevance of criminal opportunism in illicit hubs as against actively developed criminal market driven by criminals themselves due to the potentials of the market example, mineral exploitation as opposed to cattle rustling. Uh, we have a question from Namdi Obasi. Um, 
who is from International Crisis Group, who said first, thank you very much for a very impressive project. Findings on Nigeria are particularly fascinating. However, we ha I have two questions. The first one is, could you please clarify your criteria for mapping the broader crime zone, given that in Nigeria, for instance, illicit economies, particularly on, of weapons, trafficking, and kidnapping for ransom are impacting insecurity and armed violence in broad section of the country. The second question he's asking is, do you have any findings on the reverse relationship of how instability, conflict, and force dis placement of fueling illicit economies and organized crime in West Africa. Uh, last question from uh, Toure Lansine, who's also connected to Nigeria with a uh, black, uh, um, uh, with a criminal organization. He says, what are the links between the Nigerian black acts, criminal group and sub-Saharan terrorist organization? Uh, Kingsley, we get back to you. Um, uh, thank you very much again, Mohammed. Um, I think um, Namdi Obasi raised uh, some very important question. Uh, I'll touch on the first one, and then I'm sure Lies would like to intervene in the second question from uh, Namdi Obasi. Um, he wants to know that um, of what, how do we define broader crime zones? Uh, so crime zones are relatively larger regions where there's a cluster of illicit economies that interrelate directly or indirectly. And uh, like uh, Obasi rightly mentioned, in Nigeria, we have such areas where you have um, a multiple, you have multiple uh, illicit economies working operating in that region. For example, I'll give you an example, the Tansado, which I touch in my uh, presentation, the Tansado forest, uh, it's an example of a crime zone and um, it has a combination of kidnapping for ransom, cattle rustling, illicit gold trade. You also have um, uh, a lot of arms trafficking. Another example of a crime zone is the is uh, you have uh, the Plateau North Senatorial Zone, where you have multiple hotspots within this very crime zone. So, what how we define crime zones are areas with multiple hotspots, uh, including transit points. Uh, I hope that clarifies that. Um, I'll now hand over to Lias who um, I'm sure would like to intervene on um, the reverse relationship or causality between instability, conflict, and forced displacements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kingsley, and thank you, Nandi, for your, for your question. Yeah, I, you know, as I said in the presentation, the, the, the issue of, of causality is a really complex one, um, and there's no sort of obvious, easy answer to the question of, you know, the sort of the chicken in the egg question does, you know, is criminality attracted to areas of instability or does, uh, or does, you know, do illicit economies generate instability? I think from the findings from this research, but also um, the findings of, of the, the Global Organized Crime Index and the, the ANACS Africa Organized Crime Index, both sort of show that it's a very much a, a, a sort of self-reinforcing cycle. Um, between between illicit economies and and instability, um, you know, illicit economies don't you know necessarily lead to to armed conflict. But when you have illicit economies such as arms trafficking um, that are sort of weaponizing um, weaponizing the conflict, and you know, illicit economies that act as um, that act as sources of funding to conflict actors. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that in certain circumstances, these these are driving, you know, conflict and, and violence. And from from this research perspective, that was the main sort of focus of the monitor. So it's the way in which illicit economies drive instability. Having said that, there are certain indicators within the monitor that 
can be sort of interpreted both ways. So weapons, for example, you know, weapons, as I, as I just mentioned, you know, weapons do cause conflict, do cause instability. But on the other hand, in, 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 in civil conflict settings or, you know, violent settings, generally speaking, you know, the leakage of arms into the illicit trade, the underground trade, is sort of a one manifestation of the of the opposite relationship. Um, you know, there are certain indicators, again, you know, socioeconomic deprivation is included in the monitor, but also um, issues of, of forced displacement of people, that these are all um, indicators that are, are both causes and consequences. Um, and again, you know, I think one of the key, the key things throughout all of this research is that n not much is, 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 is straightforward. Um, n there's no simple answer to anything. And, and you really do need to look into the nuances and, and, and in particular, you know, across a region as large as West Africa to look at it uh, at a more subnational level, sort of on a case by case basis to assess, you know, the, the sort of dynamics, you know, and the sort of causality chains of causality. If I could just jump in here um, on on some of the questions that are yes, go ahead, on, Lucia. Go ahead, Lucia. Um, on financial flows, and perhaps I'll group some of those together. So, firstly, financial flows are something that we we of course do track and look at as part of our research. And you will find some details regarding money laundering and financial flows in the details of specific hubs. Um, so the the data and evidence available on the online mapping tool. Um, you won't find specific uh, tracking of individuals or entities across continents in this report because the analytical report looked at presenting some of the overarching findings from the data and evidence that we've pulled together through the mapping um, initiative. But it is, of course, clear that illicit financial flows are an absolutely key connecting point between illicit economies in different regions. And there was a question also around the, the variations in the um, kind of money laundering prevention um, regulatory structures across the region. And I won't go into the comparative strengths and weaknesses of, of each country, but it is, of course, important to consider the FATF um, grey list, um, which really effectively does identify some of the key money laundering risks on a national level. And when we're doing our, our research, um, and this was a question on financial due diligence, we certainly consider unexplained sources of wealth. And we also look into investment in property in the construction industry, which is a really common sector for the laundering of funds from illicit economies across a number of countries in the region. We know that um, certainly some illicit um, funds are laundered through um, Dakar's construction sector and we also see investment in property in different countries of Europe including Paris and Lisbon. Um, and another thing to keep an eye out for is the regulatory frameworks for establishing com companies and then regulating on them once they are set up. Um, some Regulatory frameworks really enable a lack of transparency around ownership. Um, that includes the structures in Guinea-Bissau, which of course facilitates the use of company structures for um, money laundering. And then to touch on Mwazu's question, and thank you very much for this, um, around the contrast between criminal opportunism and perhaps more sophisticated uh, criminal networks. You, you may have noticed that we have used throughout um, the report the terminology of illicit economies rather than organized crime, because we feel the latter really conjures images of a level of sophistication and organization that although are true in some contexts are certainly not true of other dynamics. And so, um, you know, classifying some illicit economies, which operate uh, to some extent more as informal livelihoods, and Mazu highlighted some of the mineral and extractive sector, where elements of this sector certainly fall fall into that bucket, are those where um, that that organised crime term terminology becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, 
finally to touch on the question that, that focused on the economic development of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, of course, the economic development has been extremely impressive um, and, you know, is really positioning Cote d'Ivoire as an economic as well as a political powerhouse in the region. Um, there, there are concerns around the potential inequality of some of that economic development, um, which may continue to um, feed into strains and stresses. And perhaps another point to underscore, um, given the relevance of it to the hotspot mapping initiative, is the increasing um, threat from armed group activity in the north of the country. And this um, could really be a, a significant challenge to some of the really promising trends that are being seen in Cote d'Ivoire. And of course, this threat is not isolated to Cote d'Ivoire. We also see um, the increased risk of armed group attacks in the northern areas of a number of the littoral states, predominantly Benin, Togo, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. And this is really reflected also in the mapping where you see that the the, the hubs right along the coastline, um, as Liz noted earlier, are typically um, low scoring. But as we shift um, further north to some of these northern areas, we, we start to get more and more hubs in the medium and high bands, which show this interconnection um, between the illicit economies that have long existed in these areas and the growing activities of armed actors. So this is certainly a, a priority area um, to, to keep an eye on and, and to, to keep focusing uh, interventions on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia, for your very insightful answer. Um, uh, let's continue with a series of questions the audience is asking actually. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Baras Tejudo uh, from University of Madrid, who is asking, uh, how do you perceive the French withdrawal from Mali and whether this issue will affect insecurity in West Africa uh, in terms of attending to the insecurity overspread from the Sahel to West Africa in recent years. And what do you know about the approach of Russia to illicit economies in the region? Um, the second question is from Ali, who said, in regard to the illicit economies, what role a private security group as Wagner is playing in Mali and CAR linked to mining gold, gold mining? I just saw a report, a short paragraph in your report. Could you elaborate more please on this? Um, and the last question from Joseph, why do you think coastal states in West Africa, on average, manage to keep low level of violence despite high prevalence of crime, unlike the states in the Sahel? In many instances, their state capacity seem to be comparable. Um, uh, Lucia, should we go with you first? Of course, I'll, I'll jump in and then, um, of course, Kingsley and Lewis, um, please do add. So a number of questions on the presence of Russia and the Wagner Group in the region. Um, the tracking the, the Wagner Group was, was not the focus of this mapping initiative, although, of course, they are an increasingly important actor in security dynamics and in some contexts, illicit economies. Um, we do have um, other pieces of research that focus more closely on the role of the Wagner Group, some of which we have um, already published and some of which are in train. Um, it's clear from from the situation in the Central African Republic and how that has evolved, that um, there are very strong indications that the Wagner Group does have some interest in the extractives industry uh, there. And there are some early signs that perhaps this is um, being re replicated in Mali. Um, I won't go um, too far in, into depth into that here because we are, um, you know, Oh, this is part of our ongoing research and there will be more details available later. Touching on the withdrawal of France, um, well, we, we do have some preliminary indications that this has enhanced insecurity and impunity in, in some areas of Mali. For example, we have some nascent pointers that there has actually been a surge in cattle rustling in a number of areas where there was previously more of a presence of France and other international actors. And so we're looking into to see whether um, this, these are connected, but it does seem likely at this stage. 
And then finally, to touch upon a really interesting question around the relationship of why there is lower uh, violence in some of the coastal states. Um, we one, one point that I think is worth highlighting here is that in terms of the dynamics of illicit economies and how they operate, we often um, see that corruption and violence are, are two different forms of um, enabling control. And so in, in some countries where there is a very high degree of state involvement um, or involvement of certain elements of the state in some illicit economies, we do typically see a lower degree of violence um, because the economy is facilitated instead um, through that corruption. And there is significant state presence, um, even though um, the, some countries may, may score lowly on some of the governance indicators. So to use, for example, the, the cocaine economy in Guinea-Bissau, um, where we do know that there's a high degree of state protection, there's overall a relatively low degree of violence um, because that protection structure is very, um, very structured and there isn't really a need for violence from, from actors in the economy um, to keep it going. Lias Kingsley, if either of you want to jump in. Yeah. Um... Let me jump in here. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, I'll go back to a question raised by um, Nasiru Nawal. I think it's a very important question, which uh, he wants to know what, to what extent are authorities complicit in, in enabling the thriving of illicit economies? Um, I'll give examples from Nigeria. And um, I'll touch on two illicit economies, uh, the drug trafficking uh, economy in Northeast Nigeria, especially Borno, with a specific focus on Maiduguri. Uh, recent arrests indicate um, a, a involvement of uh, security, serving security officers actually caught in the act of trafficking drugs. Now this, um, of course, this does not tell us the extent to which they are involved, but we do know that um, security agents are actually directly involved to some degree in drug trafficking in Borno State, for example. Uh, then um, if you come down to Northwest Nigeria and North Central Nigeria, we also know that um, uh, looking at cattle rustling specifically, we know that uh, many cattle rustlers actually bribe security officers that are manning checkpoints to bypass them. These security officers get paid and they look the other way and cattle rustlers can transport cattle from from, for example, from Southern Kaduna, from Jaws, uh, all the way through the Southwest, even up to Lagos and Port Harcourt. So um, it is actually, although we know they are involved, but it's difficult to actually, uh, in very specific terms, say uh, the extent of this involvement, like the scale of it. Um, also, if you look at the arms trafficking market, especially North Central Nigeria, uh, there's a very deep involvement of uh, security forces. And uh, we know gun runners that work with security forces, especially for example, returning soldiers from the Northeast uh, are known to come back to conflict areas like Jos and Southern Kaduna with uh, weapons, with guns and ammunition. So we do know that uh, security forces, elements within the security architecture of the country are complicit in some of these illicit economies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kingsley, uh, for your answers. Um, thanks also to Lucia and um, Yes, for your very, very insightful answers. I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. And I would like to express our sincere gratitude once again to Heike Tille, the Director for Civilian Prevention and Stabilization and the German Federal Foreign Office more broadly for their support. 
in this research. Thank you to all of our speakers and of course to you in the audience for listening and actively engaging through your questions. If you haven't already done so, I would already strongly encourage you to check out our online tool uh, on the website of the GI Talk. You will find some elements, some documents you can use for your future work. I'm also going to remind you that we have another event that will be held on the 22nd of September, which will focus on the Jnim, on the role of Jnim in Burkina Faso as strategic criminal actor. Thank you once again for taking part to this session. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.